What's up, my wizards? It's Dev. From SBMTG, we like magic, and today I'm going to give you the most comprehensive pre-release guide for Corset 2019 you'll find on this entire website, or any other website for that matter. We're going so deep today that not only am I going to give you my best like commons and uncommons in each color, but for the first time ever, I'm going to go into the rares a little bit and show you some of those you should be looking out for. Plus, towards the end of the video, I've even crunched a bunch of numbers for you. So, we've got a lot to talk about. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Well, first things first, I want to go ahead and get this out of the way. There's a cycle of uncommon horses that if you come across, you might want to play them provided that you're in those colors. You know, they all look pretty solid. The blue one doesn't look great, but it probably shines in a format like Sealed more than any other format you could possibly play the card. So I'd even play the bad one, but all the other horses look pretty good, especially both the black and the green one. The black one is just effectively creature removal on a body, which is always good in almost any format, especially sealed if they've got smaller guys. And as far as the green one goes, it's the only creature with hexproof in the entire format, and that's especially good in sealed, where removal is so important, and it's on a pretty big body, so these two are pretty good. I think they're the best of the cycle, but the white one is fine, as is the red one. These are both also playable if you're in these colors. Now I want to set aside a little bit of time to talk about some of the rares that you want to be on the lookout for. I usually don't talk about rares in pre-release videos because it's almost guaranteed that you're not going to get a specific rare, but there's a bunch of rares that I at least want to bring up here because in this set specifically, some rares are definitely better than others. You know, we see a bunch of rares in the set that are meant to be narrow answers in formats like modern, you know, so there are going to be some rares that seem like dead slots, but that makes the good rares all that more important, plus it's just more information, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now when it comes to the white rares to look out for, there are a few that seem good. There's a 5 mana sweeper, Cleansing Nova, that's a bomb, plus Lena is obviously very good in a format like Sealed, where if she comes into play and makes 2 or 3 tokens, that's a ton of board presence. Plus, you can get a cool advantage during combat where you can just swing in small guys and not care because you can just give them indestructible by sacking Lena. That looks like a good rare too, but Leonin War Leader is the one I think you should be the most on the lookout for here. You know, if this gets two attack steps in, let's just say, it can snowball out of control really quickly, and board presence is everything in a format like Sealed, and this gives you a ton of board presence if it can attack profitably. Now, Blue has a bunch of pretty decent looking rares too, you know, Gen of Wishes has always been a great card in Sealed, and this time around, Mystic Archaeologist looks like it can bust a game wide open. That's a great late game mana sink right there, but I think Wind Reader Sphinx, if you can make it to the 7 mana, is easily the best of the blue rares, you know, this can just just run away with a game, especially if there's more than one flying creature on either side of the board. Wind Reader is ridiculous. And Black has some good rares too this time around. Fraying Omnipotence looks like a real bomb in the sealed format. Plus, Open the Graves looks better than it might appear initially. This will help you keep up in board presence if you lose creatures in combat, and it will help invalidate opponents' removal. For 5 mana in sealed, you can do a lot worse than Open the Graves. This will help you keep up a board presence in comparison to your opponent. And it will help you make attacks that you otherwise wouldn't be too comfortable making. you still get some value when your creatures die. So I like Open the Graves, but easily my favorite of the black rares is Graveyard Mark. I expect this card to do big things in standard, and it looks really good for sealed too, where if this gets you, you know, again, just like open the graves, it'll turn dead creatures into more board presence, and that is ridiculous. Plus, you can do this at instant speed, and it comes with a decent body for the cost too. Just Graveyard Marshal is unbelievable. But red, I think, has far and away the best rares in this limited environment, and I think that's to make up for a lack of power at the lower rarities. There's some decent commons, but the uncommon slot doesn't look great. We'll get to it later. But as far as the rares go, red has a lot of crazy stuff. Dismissive Pyromancer looks like a good card in sealed to me. Same thing with Demanding Dragon. This is obviously a bomb, huge flying creature with a crazy under the battlefield trigger. Everyone likes that. There's also Spitflame and Banefire, both removal at the rare slot. You'll pick up these anytime you get them. They're absolutely crazy. But for my money, the best rare in red is probably Lathless, just because it's a huge flying body, one of the biggest flying bodies in the entire set, and you can get extra value off of it, and it has fire breathing effectively, and any other dragons you play for that matter. So Lathless looks like the biggest bomb rare in red, but there are plenty to be had. And to tie it all together here, green has some decent rares this time around too. Goreclaw looks like a good, efficient creature, you know, big body for the cost, plus a great trigger whenever it attacks. So, Goreclaw obviously looks hot, 
But there's also Thorn Lieutenant, which is just always going to be good. Like, it's a, it's a pretty fat body for the cost. It can get you extra value. It's a great mana sink lake. There's just nothing wrong with Thorn Lieutenant. This is playable in every deck that runs green. There's also Palaka Worm. If you can get to it, again, 7 mana is a lot, but seals the format where you're fairly likely to get to 7 mana, and once you do, this is the best big creature in the entire set. So I like the Worm, but aside from that, my favorite green rare is probably Hungering Hydra, because cards like this tend to snowball out of control and sealed really quickly and really easily. Plus, it's awesome to have a top deck like this late game where it just comes down as like a 6-6 six, six or a 7-7. Seven, seven. But now we're getting into the meat of the video here, the best commons and uncommons in each color. The reason I always do this is because these are the cards that you're most likely to encounter. You're going to see way more commons and uncommons and you're going to see rares. And it's really important that you know which ones to identify as the ones to look out for. A white is slightly thin and uncommon, but there are at least three that I think I want to point out that are better than the others by a lot. Herald of Faith, Hieromancer's Cage, and Militia Bugler are looking like really standout uncommons in white to me. Herald of Faith is just a big fat flyer that's going to gain you some life. It's got like half lifelink. Nothing wrong with that. I actually think it's among easily the best uncommons in this color. Hieromancer's Cage is just obligatory removal that takes care of a lot of stuff and exiles it. And there's just not a whole lot of enchantment hate in this set outside of like Reclamation Sage. A couple of other cards like Naturalize. So I think Hieromancer's Cage is ridiculous. Um, as usual, and even better than usual, in a set that's a little bit lighter on the enchantment removal than usual. Militia Bugler, too, is just a solid body for the cost with a decent keyword in sealed, and it helps you dig for more creatures. Just anything that gets you sort of selection or card advantage in sealed is always good, especially when it comes stable to a body. After that, it sort of becomes slim pickings at the uncommon slot in white, but we do have Make a Stand and Knightly Valor. Knightly Valor is always a better card than it looks like, and again, there's less enchantment removal this time around, or at least from what I can tell, than we usually have, so Auras are a little bit safer, and even the removal doesn't look as prolific or good this time around as it did in Dominaria, so another reason that Auras are, again, a little bit safer than usual. Plus, this will always provide at least some board presence for you and make one of your creatures really big, so Knightly Valor is always better than we tend to rate it in Sealed. It's always a better card than it looks like. And as far as Make a Stand, this is just a blowout combat trick that does cost a lot of mana, but it can really turn the tides quickly. Now at the common slot in white, we get both Luminous Bonds and Take Vengeance. I just want to quickly highlight these, because there are another couple of playable pieces of white removal that, again, you'll play whenever you get them. These are just going in your deck if you're in white, so just be on the lookout for those. But there's also really solid creatures in white at this rarity. I like Angel of the Dawn. That looks fine. Also Daybreak Chaplain and Gallant Cavalry look fine to me as well. Gallant Cavalry will put two creatures on the board. That'll get you a nice burst, especially if you want to curve into Angel of Dawn. That seems like a good play. But Angel of Dawn is just nice in that it's a big flying creature that gives all your dudes an anthem effect when it enters the battlefield. That is really good at the top end of the curve in an aggressive build, so I like that a lot. Daybreak Chaplain is the opposite of an aggressive creature. You know, it's got a relatively big butt in the early game that's going to not only block against aggressive builds, but also gain you a little bit of life back. Looks like a decent speed bump against those decks. So I like Chaplain a lot. It's an unassuming card, but I think this is a great early game blocker. And the only other creature I really want to talk about in white is Pegasus Courser. This was good the last time we saw it, literally the last set, and creatures like this tend to be very good. Now, this time around, it looks like white has some pretty decent creatures on the top end and some playable removal. There's at least three decent playable pieces of removal at the lower rarities in this set. I like that, but if there's one problem, and I think it is a real problem, is that this time at least, white doesn't have as many good creatures on the low end, you know? White is known, it's kind of its bread and butter for having good creatures at two and three converted mana costs. And even though there are some in this set, I don't think there are as many as usual, or at least to my eye there aren't. So I gotta take some points off for that, but white is still a pretty strong color. So I'll give it a B plus this time around. I think there's gonna be a lot of decks that feature white in them in this sealed and this draft environment for what it's worth. Both, both white blue and white red look like pretty good aggressive strategies this time around. So since white is probably going to take the front seat a a lot in sealed and draft, I have to give it a pretty high score. Now in blue, I'm seeing real power at both the uncommon and common slots, which I'm a little surprised by, um, considering how blue has tended to be lately. But I'm seeing a lot of good stuff here, but my top three uncommons are Departed Deckhand, Horizon Scholar, and Exclusion Mage. 
and as far as exclusion mage goes, these kinds of creatures are always good in, in multiple formats, honestly. Uh, but they're especially good in sealed, where board presence and tempo are very important. Who builds their board better and who builds their board faster is often paramount in a game of sealed. So a card like Exclusion Mage is really good for wrecking your opponent's tempo and putting a body on the board. That's great. Horizon Scholar, just a big fat flyer with a great end of the battlefield trigger that helps you see more cards. And that's awesome. Plus it leaves you with a really nice body in the air. Horizon Scholar's always been good. Don't see that changing. As far as Departed Deckhand goes, this is both a nigh unblockable two drop. It's basically a bear with upside. It's always, always good and sealed. And the fact that it can only be blocked by like a couple of creatures in the whole format is really, really nice. And I think that those creatures are mostly at rare for that matter. So that's even better. And it's a mana sink that in the late game is going to help other creatures get through for combat damage. Departed Deckhand might as well be a bomb rare for all I'm concerned. This is a very good card. Now some other blue uncommons that I like are Switcheroo and Ether Tunnel, believe it or not. I really think that it's going to be a little bit more safe to play Auras this time around. There's really just not much premium removal, or at least not as much as we're used to seeing. So Ether Tunnel looks especially good considering it just gets a creature through unblocked and gets it a, a power bonus. Oh, that's fantastic. And Switcheroo is actually one of the more stressful cards to have to play around after your opponent knows that you have it. And before your opponent knows that you have it, it's just straight up good where you can trade a relatively garbage creature for the best creature in their deck that they've been waiting to play all game. And at the common slot, I'm seeing a lot of good playable stuff here too. You know, Aviation Pioneer, even Wind Mage, and Omen Speaker are all really good creatures. Omen Speaker's always been a good creature. Just a solid blocking body in the early game that helps you see cards. That's really good. Nothing wrong with Omen Speaker. I'm glad that it's back. As far as Wind Mage and Pioneer, these are both creatures that are or create flying creatures. That's always good. Even Wind Mage is another Wind Drake with upside. It's got a form of prowess, and that is really, really good if you've got any combat tricks in your deck. That's fantastic. And Aven Pio Aviation Pioneer puts two creatures on board. One of them flies. Again, developing your board presence, your board state, is very important and sealed. This helps you do that better than your opponent, or at least at a faster rate, um, in terms of bodies on board than your opponent. And you get some evasion out of the deal. Now, I like blue a little bit more this time around than I have lately. My last couple of limited reviews, I have rated blue somewhat low compared to the other colors, but this time around, I'll switch that, flip it, and reverse it. I actually think that blue is relatively strong this time, you know? It's got some really good creatures. It's looking like more of an aggressive color than it usually is. So I like blue here. I think it's going to go good in tandem with a couple of colors this time. So I will give blue a solid B this time around where it's usually been C plus territory. Now black has a lot of good flyers at the uncommon slot. We've got Fell Spectre, Vampire Sovereign, and Ravenous Harpy. Now Ravenous Harpy is going to cost you a little bit of board presence, but there's going to be times where you don't care. Either your creatures are going to die in combat anyway, so you might as well sacrifice them. Maybe your opponent's targeted them with removal, so you might as well sacrifice them, get a counter on Harpy, and by the end of the game, this can be a 3, 4, sometimes 5 power flyer. And, and there are also times where you just sacrifice half your board to get this through for flying and to get that last five, six points of damage that you might need. There's a lot of cases where Ravenous Harpy is really good. Fell Spectre might be a little small for a four mana casting cost, but I really like the Enter the Battlefield trigger a lot. The two life is just okay, but them discarding a card is really good, especially at four mana where you're going to be making them discard. Um, their bomb, a lot of the time, they're five or six, seven mana bomb that they've been sitting on all game. So I really like Fell Spectre for that reason. It might not be the biggest creature in the air, but it's still a blocking body in the air, if nothing else, that makes them discard a card. So it's a two for one. Those are always good and sealed in just about any format, for that matter. As far as Vampire Sovereign, this is another thing where it's got a decent end of the battlefield trigger, but not one that's incredible. It doesn't affect the board or anything, but it can help you get back up in you know in terms of life and that can be important if you've taken a hit in the early game and it does look like there are going to be some aggressive strategies in this limited environment so it might be very important to turn the corner in terms of you know now you've got a three four flyer and you gain some life back i like a lot about this card it looks particularly busted and sealed Aside from that, though, in the uncommon slot in black, we've got Gravedigger making a return, as well as Murder making a return. Just obligatory Murder mention, this is the best piece of removal in the entire set. There are no creatures that naturally have Indestructible or any tricky stuff like that. The only thing you have to worry about, really, is the Hexproof on the horse, the green oars. Aside from that, Murder takes out every single thing in this entire limited environment, except for maybe Chromium sometimes. <laughs> Aside from that, you're pretty much good to go with Murder. It's the best piece of removal you could be playing. 
playing. And Gravedigger is just always good. You know, this is an effective two for one in a way. You know, you get a body back from your graveyard and you get a body on the board. That is always good no matter what. Black is looking slightly thin at the common slot, though, I gotta say, but there are some good things I want to point out, mostly in the form of removal. You know, Lich's Caress and Strangling Spores are both really solid removal pieces. Aside from that, Black does have some solid creatures like Skeleton Archer and Sky March Bloodletter at the common slot, as well as a decent combat trick in Abnormal Endurance. This is one of the better combat tricks in the format. But as far as Archer and Bloodletter, Bloodletter is another, just strictly better win Drake. Those are always good. It gets you a little bit of value, plus some life gain triggers, if you're playing cards that care about life gain trigger. So that that's pretty good right there. Plus it's just a solid body flyer. And Skeleton Archer is actually a really strong looking common. You know, remember that this doesn't have to just take out one toughness creatures. You can play this after combat on your turn and wipe, you know, a three or four toughness creature that only has one damage left on it. It's really important being able to, you know, kill one of their creatures and get a hill giant, you know, four mana three three on the board is actually a really important play in sealed. So Skeleton Archer better than it looks. Now, Black's strong suit is out in full force this time around. Like, the removal in Black is easily the best removal in the format. But I think that Black is lacking some strong bodies at both common and uncommon. Again, there are a couple, but just not enough to really make Black a feature color, I think. It all depends on your pool, and there's some decent rares in Black, yes. But for the most part, at the cards, at the rarity of the cards you're going to see the most often... Black just doesn't have the best bodies in the world, and I gotta take some points off for that too. So even though the removal is very good and Black's gonna show up in some decks, I'm gonna give it a B- minus this time around, because I just don't think there's a whole lot of sustainability in Black. It's not gonna be the best color in your deck, but you're gonna play it for the removal factor a lot of the time. Now, red is lacking a little bit at the uncommon slot. I already talked about that, but there are standout uncommons here. I obviously like Lightning Strike, obligatory Lightning Strike mention. You'll play that if you get it. But there's also Siegebreaker Giant and Volcanic Dragon. These are amazing creatures at the uncommon slot. Both of them are very, very good. Siegebreaker Giant looks like a great mana sink. It can help you break a game open late. And Volcanic Dragon, this is just great to have at the uncommon slot. This is a returning card that I really liked way back in the day, um, but obviously it's not so much a rare level card anymore. Power Creep is a real thing, but now that we've got it on Uncommon, it's absolutely crazy in the limited environment, whether you're playing Draft or Sealed. Having a 4-4 Flyer with Haste is unbelievable, so this is a great card that can come down out of nowhere in the late game and help you finish a game off. But red makes up for a little bit of thinness at the uncommon slot with, again, both good rares and really good commons, which is what I'm going to talk about now. But not only do we get Electrify and Shock as decent removal pieces, Electrify just takes out a lot of creatures in, in this format, and Shock has the distinction of being the only, like, one mana instant in the entire set at a lower rarity. That's really important. It's basically a combat trick for one mana, and that can be important too. But in terms of actual combat tricks, Sure Strike might be the best combat trick in the entire format. Plus 3, plus 0 in First Strike for 2 mana is going to help even small creatures take out really, really big stuff. Or it's just a pump spell that helps small creatures get through for a lot of damage if they go unblocked. So in an aggressive build, Sure Strike is, again, maybe the best combat trick in the format. But there's common creatures in red, too, that are really good. We get Havoc Devils, Spark Tongue Dragon, and Goblin Instigator. Goblin Instigator is a great way to develop your board early. You know, getting two creatures on board for two mana on turn two is actually a really good play, especially if you've got any Goblin Synergies in your deck at all. That's very good. But Havoc Devils is just a solid body with Trample, which can be important. A 4-mana four 4-3 four, is not the worst body in the world in this limited environment. Plus, the Trample, again, can go a long way if it's being chump-blocked, so keep that in mind, too. But Spark Tongue Dragon is maybe the best of these cards, considering that it's at the very least at the floor of the card. It's a 3-3 flyer, and those are at least playable even at 5 mana, but if you have the extra mana to pump into it, it's almost always going to zap something on the other side of the board and give you a relatively meaty flyer, so that is really good, especially for a common. 
I've already said that I am pretty impressed by Red's rares this time around. Yeah, you might get an Alpine Moon, but there's plenty of Red rares to go around that are all super bombs. I think that we're a little bit thin and uncommon here, but Red makes up for that with some really decent commons. So, I like a lot of what Red is doing in this set, and again, along with White, I think it might be a really good deck in both limited, you know, in both draft and sealed this time. So, I'm liking Red as a color, digging a lot of what it's doing, and it helps make up for what white is lacking in the, you know, lower converted mana cost. Red has some pretty decent stuff at 2 and 3 mana, and especially when it comes to 4 and 5 mana creatures, red just has it all up and down the curve, creature-wise. Plus, obviously, you get removal, too, like Lightning Strike and Shock. So, I'm going to give red a B plus this time. It looks particularly strong. Now in green, really powerful uncommons are actually surprisingly difficult to come by in this set, but there are some that I at least want to bring up here. I like Drad, Green Seeker, Vigilant Bayloth, and Gaspark Twins. Gaspark Twins cost an awful lot. This is tied for the highest, you know, CMC of any uncommon creature in the entire set. But if you do get it out, it's just a house. It can block an extra creature. That's crazy. And that's usually <laughs> enough to stop small creatures from attacking at all a lot of the time. Plus, it's got Trample on a 7-7 body, so this is a game-ending uncommon if you can play it. It's kind of a bomb at this at this rarity slot, so play that if you get it and you're in green, but Vigilant Bayloth is a relatively aggressive costed 5-5 with Vigilance, and Vigilance gets better the bigger the creature it's on. So a 5-5 Vigilance threatens to attack every single turn and block their best creature every turn too, and live to tell the tale. So Vigilance on a 5-5, especially for only 5 mana, actually a really good deal. And Green Seeker is tapped to draw a card like over 40% of the time if you're playing 17 or more lands in your sealed deck, so and you, and you are, I would imagine. So, you know, a, a success rate, a hit rate of over 40% is really, really good, and it's low-costed with a pretty big butt for its mana cost, so there's really no harm in just blocking during your opponent's turn with it, and then at the end of their turn, tapping it to see if you can draw a card. But I also kind of like Gear Upper Guide and Reclamation Sage. Reclamation Sage is at least a body, so it's playable even without having to just keep it in your sideboard. You know, every card you don't use in your main deck and sealed is in your sideboard for games two and three during the pre-release. Remember that, but I might almost main deck this, especially, again, there are a lot of auras in this format and not a whole lot of enchantment hate. So, you might be seeing more auras than usual in the sealed environment, and this is very good against them. Plus, there's a slight artifact theme in blue, um, and white for that matter, so if people are trying to jam, you know, three, four artifacts into their deck to get some of these synergies to work, Reclamation Sage could prove pretty powerful against those strategies too. And I'll briefly mention Gear Per Guide here, just because it was much better than anticipated in Kaladesh Limited, and we don't want to make the same mistake twice. This can be a really good card. It's 3 mana, 3 2, which is at least decent stats. You don't want it to trade with their 2 drop, but it can sometimes also trade with their 4 drop, which is something you do want. But in the meantime, this can make creatures semi unblockable, depending on your opponent's board state. So, Gear Per Guide has always been a decent mana sink, and again, just was much better than we originally thought it was going to be in Kaladesh Sealed, so look out for it this time. As far as the green commons here, a lot of my favorite ones are kind of boring, to be honest, but it's the way the cookie crumbles this time, you know? I do like Bristling Boar, which is probably the least boring of my inclusions on the green commons list, but Bristling Boar is a decent body for the cost, and it can't be gang-taggled, which is really important in Sealed, where gang-tackling is something that happens all the time, so... That might be a really important bit of text there, but if nothing else, it's at least a 4 mana 4-3, which is relatively imposing. Other green cards I like at common are Rabid Bite and Titanic Growth. These are both decent cards, and a Rabid Growth is kind of a green removal spell. We see a fight spell in just about every limited environment now. No different here, Rabid Bite is a card you'll play if you have no better choices. And Titanic Growth is just crazy, <laughs> right? Plus four, plus four makes even small creatures insanely big. Now, I am not as impressed with green this time around as I have been in the last few sets. Green has been getting really high limited ratings from me the last few times around this block, but this time I'm just really not seeing it as much as I have been. I'm going to go ahead and give green the lowest score of the day with a C+. It's still solid. There's a lot of big bodies here, which is what you expect from green, obviously, but I'm just not seeing some of the real, like, power that we've been seeing in green the last few limited reviews. So I'm not saying that C+, is a terrible score, but it's definitely not as good looking to me as the other colors this time.
But I want to round out this video with the artifact and gold uncommons and commons that I want you to keep an eye out for. There's a few really good artifacts in the set, and as previously mentioned, there's an artifact sub-theme in a couple of the colors, so you really want to be on the lookout for some decent artifacts. Turns out there's plenty, though. At the uncommon slot, I like Arcane Encyclopedia, Suspicious Bookcase, and Diamond Mare to start out. Diamond Mare is a 2-mana, two 2 power creature that any color can play. That's good enough in a lot of ways, but it's a lot better than just that. You know, you pick a color, and you might gain 2, 3, sometimes more life off of this over the course of the game, which again is really good against aggressive strategies. Bookcase is also pretty good against aggressive strategies. For just two mana, you can play this in the early game and block just about any aggressive creature they might play on the other side of the table. Plus, later on in the game, it turns the tables and makes their big dudes unblockable. So this has pretty decent relevance all throughout the game, and I like that about it. And Arcane Encyclopedia is probably good enough in sealed. I don't know how much we want to be playing this in draft unless we've drafted up a pretty controlling slow deck that has lots of removal. But in sealed, which is just intrinsically a slower format, Encyclopedia looks like it's going to be really good at making you see more cards, draw more cards than your opponent. And whoever draws more cards in sealed is usually going to win the game. But we're not done. I think there's actually a really good amount of power at the uncommon slot in just the artifacts. Like We also got Gargoyle Sentinel and Meteor Golem. Gargoyle Sentinel is going to be played in just about any deck um, you know, that gets this card in their sealed pool. Just a 3 mana 3-3 three, three with Defender is a decent enough deal by itself. This blocks a lot in the early and mid game, but the ability to become a 3-3 three, three flyer and actually get in some damage is really, really good too. So it's a flying creature any deck can play, and I suspect we'll see a lot of it in the sealed environment. And Aside from that, as far as Meteor Golem goes, yes, this is seven whole mana, but it's a huge creature once you do get it out, and it busts anything that you want to bust on the other side of the battlefield. You know, if your opponent's gotten to their huge bomb creature by now, this can break it for you and leave you with the biggest creature on the battlefield very likely. So, even though it's seven mana, I still think Meteor, Go Meteor Golem is worth playing in Seal, which is a slower format anyway. But there's also some common artifacts I want to briefly mention here, like Explosive Apparatus, Marauder's Axe, and Sky Scanner. Sky Scanner doesn't look like much, but it's actually a really good creature. Again, drawing cards is what you want to be doing in Sealed. Plus, you get a flying, blocking body for just three mana. You could do a whole lot worse. Sky Scanner doesn't look like much. This is actually a key sort of bread and butter creature in this limited environment. Marauder's Axe is actually not super expensive and provides a really big bonus to a creature. And it's better than Aura's, you know, if they kill the creature, then at least Axe sticks around to make something else really big. So, Marauder's Axe is one of the better, you know, limited environment equipments at a lower rarity that we've seen in a while, actually. I have high hopes for Axe. I might play one copy of this if I got it in my sealed pool. And it's common, so it's relatively likely that you'll see it. And as far as apparatus, this will give decks without removal a chance to play at least a little bit of removal. And often you will experience a tempo loss on this card. It costs four mana to kill something with two toughness or less. And often those cards are, you know, two, three mana. So there's a possibility you'll spend more mana um, than you want to, killing whatever you're killing. But it's still a removal piece and sealed that's still highly valued and any deck can play it. Even if your deck has three, four decent removal pieces, you might still want to eye that explosive apparatus pretty hard. And as far as the gold cards in this set, I think there's kind of a hierarchy to the gold cards. They're all at least somewhat playable, but there are definitely some I like more than others. Skyrider Patrol looks to make Simic a really decent you know, color combination. If you get Skyrider Patrol, I think it's probably the best of these gold cards, honestly. Not only does it fly, but it also makes creatures incrementally bigger and makes them fly as well. So it's worth every drop of mana. This looks like a very good creature in Sealed. But we've also got Poison Tip Archer and Psychic Symbiont. These are also great. You know, Poison Tip Archer not only has reach, but also death touch, which means if it blocks literally anything, the other creature is going to die. You know, Archer might too, but just the ability to basically be a removal spell against anything attacking on board is really, really important. Plus, you get a little bit of extra value when stuff dies, so I like that about Archer too. And Psychic Symbion is kind of a three for one, so even though usually you want your six mana guys that fly to be a little bit bigger than 3-3, three, three, this just does so much with its Enter the Battlefield trigger that it's definitely worth playing. Aside from that, Dragon Disciple and Aerial Engineer look really, really good as far as gold uncommons go. 
Um, Dragon Disciple can either help you ramp in the early game, and you need to ramp into some of these bigger green threats in the set, and even some of the bigger red threats in the set. So you will like this <laughs> if you're in this color combination. And in the late game, it can just be a win condition and make a 5-5 flyer for you. That is fine, too, once you have the mana for it. So it's good at just about every point of the game. That's awesome. You want that in seal. And Aerial Engineer does require an artifact, but once you do get the artifact out, this is a really big flyer at a relatively low cost for this rarity at the very least. Heroic Reinforcements is another gold card that I do really like. Again, there's like a Boros Aggro deck out there somewhere, and this is one of the better finishers for that deck in the sealed environment, or the draft environment for that matter. And the Boros deck actually has a lot of quote-unquote finishers, you know, it gets Inspired Charge and uh, Trumpet Blast as well, but Heroic Reinforcements is probably the best of these that it could play. But there are a couple of gold cards that I think are just plain bad in comparison to the other gold cards in the sealed environment specifically. A creature like Seder Enchanter might be much better in draft, where you have more control over how many enchantments you actually get. But in your sealed pool, you're not going to get too many enchantments. Um, so a creature like Seder Enchanter just looks a little bit like a trap, as does Brawl Bash Ogre. I could see situations where this card looks really, really good, but there are things that just irk me about it. You know, I don't like sacrificing board presence in limited. I've already said that. I'll take a 4-mana 3-3 three, three minutes, but I don't see myself using the ability on this too often. But before we get out of here, let's run some numbers on the set. There's some fun things to talk about here. The average converted mana cost at common and uncommon, this does not include rares or mythics, but at common and uncommon, the average converted mana cost is 3.11, which is actually relatively low compared to some of the more recent sets. That's a pretty good mark to hit for limited, too. You want your cards to be around 3 converted mana cost on average, and they've come very close to hitting that mark with this set. So just keep that in mind. Now, in terms of different um, card types in this set, there are 105 creatures at either common and uncommon. There are 14 artifacts, 14 enchantments, 12 lands at common or uncommon, and as far as instants and sorceries, there are 27 and 24 respectively. So as usual, far more creatures than any other card type, which is what you want to see. That's what you usually get as well in a magic set. But 105 creatures is actually a little bit more than half the cards at the lower rarity. 14 artifacts, keep that in mind considering there is again a artifact sub-theme in this set and there's even an aura sub-theme in green and in, to a lesser extent green-white with Seder Enchanter. So 14 enchantments, a lot of them are auras, keep that in mind if you're running that sub-theme. Same thing with artifacts, again if you're running that sub-theme there are 14 artifacts and I think that at least 8 or 9 of them are very playable in this set. But the last thing I want to look at in terms of these numbers at least is a spread of keyword abilities on common and uncommon creatures. You'll note that there are 18 flyers at common and uncommon in the set. That is more than usual, so the skies will be relatively crowded this time around. There are five creatures with trample, three creatures with menace, two creatures with haste. There's one creature with hexproof, the green horse, one creature with death touch, it's a three mana two two in green, and one creature with flash, it's a three mana three two in black. Now, as far as other abilities like Indestructible and First Strike, there are literally zero creatures at the lower rarities um, with these abilities, which is especially surprising when it comes to First Strike. Now, when you look at this sort of spreadsheet here, I think that Menace, Trample, and Vigilance are relatively important abilities in this format. Menace is always good in Seal where you're just trying to stay up on board presence from your opponent, and while you're doing that, Menace is particularly good. Trample's also good in terms of stale board states and just trying to get through chump blockers and stuff to finish the game. Trample's an important ability, and Vigilance is also a pretty important ability, especially on big creatures like I've already said. Sealed, Vigilance can be particularly good where you threaten to, say, you know, attack with a creature and force your opponent to trade, but if they don't trade, they still have to watch what they attack with next turn. Vigilance is a much better ability in Sealed than people give it credit for. But finally, finally, last thing I want to say, I guess we'll call it bonus content, is that if I had to pick just one more card in each color to highlight real quick before we get out of here, I'd start with Star Crown Stag. This is just a big solid attacker that usually taps down the creature that would otherwise block it. It's the biggest creature on the other side of the board. We've seen this ability on creatures in white before, and it's always good in sealed and draft, and I don't see that changing here. And, and it's a relatively big body, too. It's a tough attacker to deal with. So Star Crown Stag is a really good common. Um, as far as blue goes, though, I like Anticipate, haven't pointed it out yet, and I think that it goes well in like the blue-red spells deck with Gutter Snipe and Enigma Drake. So, Anticipate, always good. You see a lot of cards, you get good selection, and you get extra cards, too. So, Anticipate is fantastic as far as blue commons go. 
In black, I really like Epic Hero of Blood if I wanted to talk about just one more common in that color. This is actually one of the bigger ground creatures in the format, believe it or not, and it's at common. And there's plenty of, you know, life gain trigger effects in this color. Um, like, if, the, for instance, there's, just as an artifact, there's the fountain that gains you a life every turn. There's a black creature that you can tap to drain your opponent. Um, there's plenty of stuff in this format that gets you life gain triggers, and a lot of it is at common or uncommon. You can pick it up and seal pretty easily. So, Epicure of Blood, plenty of ways to trigger it, but even if you never do, it's a pretty decent body for at least a relatively okay cost in sealed. In red, I haven't pointed out Volley Veteran. This is a lot like Skeleton Archer, you know? Even if it only does the one damage because it counts itself and no other goblins, that can sometimes be good, especially post-combat. But if you even have one or especially two other goblins out, then it's awesome. And it goes really well with Goblin Instigator. I should bring that up. And finally, the green card that I haven't talked about yet that I'd probably most like to highlight is actually Plummet. Now, I think Plummet is actually really good and possibly main deckable in this sealed environment. I've already said that there are a ton of flyers at common and uncommon, and there are a total of 14 more flyers at rare and mythic. So there are flyers everywhere in this set, and there's going to be a lot of flyers played at the pre-release. So Plummet might actually be a really good piece of straight-up green instant speed removal in the sealed environment. But I'm pretty sure we finally reached the end here. I'm tapped out for now, but now it's your turn. What did I miss down there? Are there cards that you like that I didn't bring up in this video? Definitely didn't have time to talk about everything that I like, but this is all the stuff that I like the most. And if this ends up helping you with your pre-release, let me know down there in the comments section next week too. In the meantime, the between time, just do all the YouTube stuff. Like the video if you enjoyed the video. It really helps me out more than you think it does. You can also sub if you haven't done that yet. Hit the bell for the notification to make sure that you actually get to know when I do new stuff. That's important, especially considering we're coming up on deck tech season and you probably want to know all that stuff. Probably want to see all dim things. Or you can kick in a dollar on the Patreon train. If you feel like doing that, if you've got the skrill, just kick me a dollar a month and that'll help out an awful lot too. Link in the description for that, but there's also a link in the description to my sponsor, TCG Player. They also help keep the lights on around here. They're good folks for that. They treat your boy right, but they also happen to be the cheapest place you can get Corset stuff online right now. Whether you want to pre-order singles or you want to get unopened booster boxes on pre-order, they have the cheapest prices you'll find online for all that. But that's all I got for this one. Hope you enjoyed the pre-release guide, and I hope you have fun at your pre-release. Join me for Deck Tech super soon, but for now... I'll catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.